Well, I'd like to sing a song that we call the driver's song. It was made up about a wee man from County Clare called Jack Hamilton that we recorded when they were building the M1. He was sitting in the largest earth-moving machine I've ever seen. It was a 92-ton job that had been brought from the Arizona desert to see how it would respond to conditions on the M1. It didn't respond very well, actually, because the following day it fell into a bog and had to be fished out by a train. But on this day, the rain was beating down, and he was on a tremendously steep embankment. And we climbed up to him and held the microphone up and said, uh, um, is it difficult to drive one of these machines? He said, oh, no, he said, even a lady could drive one of these. It was a huge machine, had 92 levers. He said, it's just a, get, a matter of getting to know them few levers. Anyway, this is his song. And Jack, if you're viewing, good on you. <laughs> Come all you gallant drivers, wherever you may be. Whether you drive a Euclid or a 54 RB, keep your hands upon the levers, cut and fill a steady load. And take it nice and steady, boys, digging up the road. You've never tried to disguise your commitment to the left and the social messages of your songs. Um, at what stage in your lifetime did, did, did you become a leftist? If I use that when term. I was a boy. I grew up during the Depression. My father was a, a militant, uh, an iron moulder, who had been one of John McLean's boys, used to stump the country with him when he was about 17. I'd been blacklisted by in every foundry in Scotland, and I knew real poverty, real hunger, and it seemed to me inconceivable that anybody could be anything other than a revolutionary. And I went on from, the, by the time I was 14, I was busily engaged in doing all kinds of things. I'd been on hunger marches, I'd worked street theatres out on hunger marches, wrote songs for hunger marches, often parodies of pop songs. I ran a group called the Red Megaphones, and there were six of us, all kids, and we had these megaphones, and we stand the corner and we say, uh, Open your windows, open your doors, we are the red megaphones, you know, and then we perform a ten-minute sketch, hopefully before the cops arrive and, right. and bundled us off or on the, on the steps of baths in marketplaces anyway, you know. And you're an absolute believer in, in art as a weapon of, of the revolution, of social change, especially music, folk music. Yeah, I, I don't believe that the, today there is any art worthy of the name besides the art created by the working class in the course of its struggle. Peggy, can you tell me about your beginnings? You come from a very famous folk family. Completely different background. Um, middle class intelligentsia, I would reckon, is what, what the, the, the jargon would call it. Parents both professional musicians, a very comfortable life, uh, never really hungry until I decided to be hungry by not mailing home for the money when I went away, you know. Um, what stage did Ewan McCall rescue you from the middle class intelligentsia? When I was 20. Well, really what Ewan did was he showed me what the songs were about and the class that the songs came from and all at once the songs had meaning. Up until then uh, there was something in them that I didn't really know why they completely captured me but when I met Ewan I discovered why. It was the total experience yes, of absolutely. living the thing and singing the thing. And, and meeting the people, the, the people who are real people, real. That was the only word I could really apply to it.